All right. Well, good morning. Good to see you all. Appreciate the chance to be here, and I appreciate the, the attendance here this morning. We've got a few things I want to cover here this morning as we, as we go begin this day. I want to start a little bit about growing a crop with some, some health and life as a, until we get into all the pestilence. Thank you, Mark. Pestilence, disease, and dying here for the rest of the day. But as we, as we start out here today, I'd like to just do a quick review. Probably have heard a lot of it already. So as, as Robert was saying, I don't want to be overly redundant, but it's worth our while to review the situation that we have with regard to water, particularly on the Colorado River. Think about that. And then in the context of crop production, our water management, some review, some basic principles there for us to, to carry into the field. Then think about some things with regard to soil, nutrient management, sodicity, et cetera, as we finish up. I think any of us working and living in Arizona are pretty well aware of the fact you can go anywhere in the state right now and you can find an abundance of challenges and say problems, challenges that we have with respect to water. And that's certainly very true when we come to the Colorado River. We know all of us living in the desert that water is life. Go to this one now? Yeah. All right. So you've got to be high tech and be able to switch things here on this, this job. But we all know living in the desert that water is our life, and that's absolutely true when we're dealing with agriculture. Our predecessors in this desert were well aware of that as well. If you go to the Hohokam and consider their civilization, they had a concentrated civilization living in this state, this region, and all of a sudden the climate changed, situations, conditions changed on them, and in the 13th century they were forced to, to disperse after a, an entire collapse of their society. They didn't leave behind any written record or any extension bulletins on the deal or anything, but based upon all available evidence, it was drought and salinization of their soils that, that created that, caused that, that problem, that demise of their civilization. More recently, in the 19th century, John Wesley Powell, famous Civil War veteran and explorer, came out west with the explorations down the Colorado River. He was oppressed by the aridity of this entire region. And he did all he could for the last part of his life to try to impress that upon legislators and policymakers in D.C. and in the developing territories throughout the West. As a matter of fact, he offered this, this very quote in 1889 to the Montana Congressional Constitution, the Constitutional Convention, where he said, all the great values of this territory have ultimately to be measured to you in acre feet. Now, that was in 1889. I remember reading this in 1989 and thinking, what a prophetic statement. We can sure think of that today. That's very true with regard to what he was pointing out to us then. So water is key to us, and it's certainly key to agriculture, and it gives us the foundation, the capacity to produce this, literally this plethora, this abundance of crops. We can grow about anything in this state, as you guys, as you all very well know. We can grow about anything if the market's there and if the capacity is for, for moving a crop is there. So with the key to it all, our foundation is with water. And that's our first limiting factor. You know, you go across, across the world, and globally speaking, the lim first limiting factor in a terrestrial ecosystem and in agriculture is sunlight. Of course, that's the, one of the advantages we have of growing in the desert is that sunlight's not limiting. Our first limiting factor is water, followed by nitrogen, bioavailable nitrogen, and that's then followed by the, the availability of good genetics. But first and foremost, it's water. That, that drives us the foundation for everything that we do. Arizona and agriculture, we utilize about 70%. We're responsible for about 70% of the, of the fresh water in the states that's diverted to agriculture. Now, with that, that water, we generate a, 23, a little over $23 billion industry. It represents about 7% of the state's gross domestic product. It's, a, it's an industry that's not only important here in Arizona and regionally, but nationally and even internationally. So it's and true with both our, our full, the abundance of both crop and animal, animal production systems that we have. If you consider the Colorado River, you know, over here in the southwest part of the, of the United States or North America, it's a really an impressive watershed out here in the, one of the western watersheds. It's impressive to the extent that it's the longest watershed in the western North America. It's the highest elevation drop in North America. And we have about... Uh, it's budgeted at 16.5 million acre feet a year. That's how it's budgeted. That's not what the river's providing, and therein, therein lies our problem. That also supports portions of seven states, the United States, two states in Mexico, so you've got an international boundary, 30 American Indian tribes, about 40 million people, and about 6 million acres of cropland. It's a heavily utilized river all the way, and it supports us all out here, and it's divided for managerial purposes into two basins. There's an upper basin, which is above Lake Powell, the lower basin that extends from there all the way to the Sierra Cortez, just a few miles south of where we are here, here today. 
in each, each of these basins, there's allocated seven and a half million acre feet. That began 100 years ago exactly with the 1922 Colorado River Compact, the agreement among the basin states. And then there's 1.5 million acre feet that's allocated to Mexico by treaty from 1945. So that's where we get our seven and a half times two plus 1.5, that's 16 and a half million acre feet that's budgeted out on this river and on this watershed. If you look at the, how it's proportioned, California gets 27% of the water by, by what we call the law of the river. And you hear this term, the law of the river, it's a, an amalgam, a collection of laws and contracts and agreements that have been basically formulated and compiled over the course of the past hundred years. And in that contract, or in those set, that set of laws, law of the river, California gets 27%, almost a full third. Colorado's second at 23 percent, and Arizona's third at 17 percent. Now, California has actually been taking all their water and some more for quite some time. Anybody that can't use their water, California's right there to help, been taking that water up. So that's a heavy, a heavy component in this whole overall system of management in terms of color, California. We knew under the best of times you can just go a little ways to our west, just literally a mile or so west to Presa Morelos. And that's the last cut on the Colorado River where water's taken out for Mexico to satisfy our treaty requirements there. That's 1.5 million acre feet. And if you go on down here to the bridge, crossing over from San Luis Rio, Colorado, over to Mexicali, the mighty Colorado River, under the best of conditions, is dry. And that's under the best of conditions. So there's no more water to be had. We're using it all, every drop of it, from the time it comes down that river to the time it gets to Presa Morelos. So the other thing that's happening, too, you notice it's been budgeted at 16 and a half million acre feet. The average flow in the past two decades has been about 12.4 million acre feet. Now you don't have to be real, real sharp at a lot of arithmetic to see there's a four, four million acre foot difference there. What we've got budgeted, what the rivers provide. And the other thing that's notable is that this, this flow of the past two and a half or over two decades has been 16% lower than it was for the most part of the 20th century. So we've definitely seen a shift. We're definitely seeing a shift in climate we're seeing a shift in climate that's resulting in the change of precipitation and effective precipitation that's coming down the river. So that's just the reality that we're dealing with. And what we're seeing too, of course, is as a result of this, it's just like any of us would have if the checkbook. If we're spending more than we're bringing in, we're gonna burn up any savings accounts we have. Our savings accounts have been the water stored in the, in the reservoirs at Lake Mead and Lake Powell. We've been drawing them down, and now both of them are down around 25% capacity right now. So it's a serious situation if we continue on, you know, right? So there's some, it's very clear that something has to happen. And so basically the problem comes down to this. You've got 16.5 million acre feet that's budgeted, 12.4 that's flowing down the river now. We've got about a 4 million acre foot differential. We've all been able to take a look at that. Anybody's kind of, kind of tracking this this water situation, realize well, this is a, a situation we have, to, we have to rectify, we have to deal with this. So much so that in June, the commissioner for the Bureau of Reclamation, Camille Tautam, when she was questioned at a Senate hearing in DC for the Natural Resource and, and Energy C uh, Council or committee, she was asked about what the plan was for the Bureau. She said the Bureau is given this Basin State 60 days right then, that was the 14th of June. So you have 60 days to come up with a plan how to manage this river within the realistic constraints of the budget. Or, she said very clearly, as a quote, the Bureau has the authority to act unilaterally to protect the system, and we will protect the system. And we all interpreted that, all of us out here in the basins, that those are pretty tough words. 60 days. And 60 days to get seven basin states, two nations, and all these entities to come up with a plan and agree. You know, I don't, that's, that's monumental. But so everybody went after it. But the only ones that really did it in a material way was the state of Arizona. Now, granted, I have a bias, right? I'm a, we're sitting here in the state of Arizona. I'm going to tell you that. But that's the honest truth. The only state that came up with a plan and proposed a plan, put a plan on the table, was Arizona. And I'll have to say, too, the, one, of the, one of the groups that probably did the heaviest lifting on this was the Ag Coalition, the Ag Groups, and the Ag Irrigation Districts on the Lower Basin. We all know if any of you working in agriculture out here for a while, you know that they, in Prigo Valley and Palo Verde Valley and Humid Valleys, they're not always, we're competing for water. <laughs> and we're competing to some extent. We're all neighbors. But to get everybody together and come up with a plan and make a proposal and literally put it on the table, which they have done, that's significant. But we're the only ones that have done it. So the, the, what has happened since then 
is that we all have been looking at this thinking, well, if they, have, if they took this, this river and this budget and they balanced it out proportionally, if it was balanced out proportionally, to think of it this way. You go from 12 million acre, we go down to 12 million acre foot budget from a 16 and a half million acre foot budget, that's 27% less. That's a 27% reduction. If it were all done proportionally across all basin states, then it'd take Arizona from our 2.8 million acre foot allocation to about two. It would take California from their 4.4 million allocation down to about 3.2. Arithmetic doesn't sound too bad, but in reality, every drop of that water is heavily demanded by each of those entities. That gives us a proportion of what we're facing. That was the motivation that drove the Arizona delegation to say, let's get a proposal on the table. The Ag Coalition says, let's get a proposal on the table, because we know in Ag, there was a target. <laughs> there was a target on our back. We use about 70% of the water in this state, and on Colorado River, Ag uses or is responsible for about 80% of the water on the river. It depends how you, where you measure and cut it, but it's about 70, 80%. So that we were anticipating what the Bureau would say. Uh, just a few weeks ago, 16th of August actually, the Deputy Secretary, Tommy Boudreau for the Department of Interior, made the announcement for, on behalf of the Bureau and the Department. And they said basically, we're just going to go to Tier 2 for Tier 2A on the Drought Contingency Plan. They kicked the can down the road. And, so, and I'll show you here what this means in terms of drought of, uh, of uh, Tier 2, Tier 2A. And so what that means is for basically for Arizona, you can hear this several times, Arizona has to take out 80,000 80, acre feet additional this year on top of what the 512,000 acre feet was last year for Tier 2, tier, tier A, Tier 1A that came out last year. What this means for us is like this. Here's where we are right now. This is where we would have been anyway. This is the drought contingency plan. In tier two, you can't, these are small letters, I'm sorry, but what we hit last year was tier one. This time last year, we had an announcement from the Bureau said, Arizona, the, whole, the, base, the river basin is going into tier one reductions in the drought contingency plan, the DCP, we call it. And that took us down right now to, that means the, the, it was done because the level of the water on the dam at Lake Mead was below 1075 above sea level, 1,075 feet above sea levels. That was the declaration for Tier 1. Arizona lost 512,000 acre feet right off the bat by the agreement of the drought contingency plan. What we're having this year, we're just going to stage 2A. That takes out the extra 80,000 acre feet this year. We really will be really close to Tier 2B, which is 1,045 feet. We're very close to that where we'll be. And, all, and I'll show you in a minute what, what all projections are. We'll be down to Tier 3 by next year. The bottom line is these drought contingency plan reductions aren't enough to solve our problem. So the Bureau kicked the can down the road on us. So we, we're dealing with this now, but we know there's more to come. There has to be more to come pretty soon. So I don't mean to be too redundant, but I want to impress this upon you. What's happening this year is 80,000 acre feet additional is coming out of the Colorado River to Arizona. That's this year. That's on top of the 512 from last year, so it means total right now Arizona's already lost 592,000 acre feet allocated based upon a 2.8 million acre foot allocation. But this year, it's 80,000 acre feet. The other thing that's important to see is that with these tiers, you go down tier one, tier two, it's agriculture. Agriculture is where the water is coming out, and it's all central Arizona agriculture. Yuma area agriculture has not lost any water yet. But all that water that's being reduced is all coming out of the CEP allocations, and it's all coming out of ag in central Arizona, primarily Pinal County, primarily two or three irrigation districts there in Pinal County. They're, right now, with this 80,000 feet, acre feet coming out this year, they're pretty much cut off of all their CEP water now. They're going back to groundwater if they can. So that's their situation. It's folding them up pretty hard here right now. Now, it won't be until Tier 3 that we would see, according to DCP, that we would see any cuts to the big cities. And then there will be the wailing and the gnashing of teeth in the cities. Now, they're hollering right now, but they haven't been reduced yet. They're starting to moan a little bit. And here's what the way this looks for us. Another way of cutting it is to say you take the lower basin states of Arizona, Nevada, California, or a lower basin states total, Mexico, collectively, you can see it's Arizona. We're now total with our 80,000 acre feet this year, we're up to 592. We're carrying the load in this state for the water reductions. Nevada has put in 25,000 acre feet. California has none. And New Mexico is putting in 104,000 acre feet. Now this is all kind of follow along on the drought contingency plan, which is also dictated to a large extent by the existing treaties in the, in the, in the river. But it's all coming out of central Arizona. 
that's who's losing the water right now is central Arizona. But as I say, there's, there is more to come. It's just we don't know when, when that will be and what the Bureau will do next. If you look ahead, now these, these models are busy, busy figures, but these are the models that the Bureau runs to project ahead for the water levels. And to take all this and cut it down, I'll just say here's the bottom line coming out of those, out of those models. Based on the models, they probably end for calendar year 2023. So basically looking at it for we'll be this time next year for a declaration from the Bureau would say we'll be in tier, tier three for sure because the projected level on the, on the dam at Lake Mead be 1,021 feet. And that trigger is 1,025 feet above sea level. So we'll easily be in tier three next year. That's the most probable outcome in a year. So that means the river still, the, the reservoir still declining at the current rate of use. And so we're not, in a, we're not in equilibrium with that yet. And we got to remember, too, what's part of what's driving this is just not just not, it's not only dry, but it's warm. It's hot. The climate is hotter. So we're, like for the past several years, we've had over 90 percent snowpack in the watershed up in Wyoming and Colorado. But it's not, that's not translating to wet water in the river, in the, in the watershed. What's happening is that water comes off in the spring when it melts. It's warmer, so it melts earlier. Of course, the first crop to pull up the waters are the trees, the forests, and the, and the mountains. Things warm up for them. They become more physiologically active. They suck up their water. Plus, we have a, a greater transition of water coming off the landscape, going into vapor faster. And we're getting less water that's actually trickling down and getting into the tributaries, into the rivers, and into our reservoirs. So that's happening to us as well. So we've got to have, we know we're going to have to deal with this. And so as old Ross Perot was, used to say, here's the deal. Here's the deal, folks. We've got the 16 and a half million acre feet budgeted. We've got a flow of 12.4 million acre feet. We have a deficit of about 4 million acre feet. The Bureau knows this. The arithmetic's not that mysterious. And, almost, and we all know it. So something's going to have to give in the, in the near future. We're wondering what and how and why. But the good news is, too, you have an Arizona delegation as a state and as the Ag Coalition. They've been doing good work for us. And they've been actually doing the best of anyone in the basin. And I don't say that just because of my Arizona partiality, but it's the, it's the honest truth. And four major questions we're all coming down to everywhere out here. How much water do we have? What's the reality of it? We've talked about that here today. How much do we really need? And then who needs it? It could be depending on who you ask. Who gets the water and how much? And then who, who decides? Like right now, a good example is the Bureau said, you all had 60 days back in June, so you decide. Well, no, people couldn't come up with a plan and an agreement, so if you can't, that means the feds are going to have to do it. And we'd rather not have that if we could. You know, we'd rather be able to make these decisions on a local level. That's all part of what we're, we're all about quite often. So, again, not to be redundant, but the bottom line for us is we're losing for this year. For this year, right now, the decree from the Bureau says Arizona's getting reduced an additional 80,000 acre feet this year. Okay? So that's what we're having happen this year. So how does that relate to us and what we do to us every day, what we do in the field? You know, we look at Arizona agriculture, the way that we see it today, it began a little over 100 years ago, about 150 years ago. And these, these lands were beginning to be developed and these territories developed in the West. What we're basically doing, we've built upon that. We've been continuing to build upon that, and that's what we have here today. These systems we have, were, the foundations for them were laid out a little, a little over 100 years ago. And what we've done, we've continually been able to improve them. I've been in this state for about almost four decades, and you've seen continual improvement with our systems, improving in efficiencies. We have the highest yields of the crops we grow in this state of anywhere in the world, the highest yields and the highest quality. We're doing it with less water than we were using before, at least in the past 40 years. We're doing it with less land. We're more efficient with our water utilization that we have. We've continued to improve upon that, in small steps of incre incremental improvement. We have a lot less. We've made huge improvements with reductions of pesticides. That's largely attributed to folks like yourself. A lot less fertilizer and pesticides going into the field and still producing high crops, high yields, and high quality. And we have an increased diversification of our cropping systems. And we also have supported viable, a very robust seed industry in this state. So we've been good stewards, I would say, of our water resources. And that doesn't mean we're done. We're continually working on improving our stewardship. So the pressure is on us. And we do this right now with a lot of different kinds of irrigation systems, not only here, but all across the state. We have you know, dead level basins that are furrowed up with every row of irrigation in various formats and structures, dead level basin, flood irrigation, drip irrigation, so overhead, overhead center pivots, 
solid set sprinklers, and we have irrigation systems that we use that specifically help us manage salinity. So for, for salinity and plant, plant growth management on these in saline type of situations. Those systems are used appropriately by farmers and agronomists across this state to appropriately utilize those tools and resources to produce the crops that we have under the conditions that we're dealing with. And we've uh, literally continued to improve on these systems all the time. So when we do this, we think about, well, what are we trying to do, really? If we're going to say, all right, the pressure's on us and we have to really improve our efficiencies here today, what are the parameters we're working around? We have to provide plant available water in the soil to prevent water stress, we know that. At the same time, we want to prevent over-irrigation. We've got to walk that fine line with that, that balance. To, we want to provide an additional amount of water for adequate leaching because we are working in desert agriculture. The other fundamental thing, I think, is we go back and we say, all right, what do we do today to improve? Remember, there's some per certain parameters we have to face and we have to deal with, one of which is this fundamental photosynthesis. We're growing plants that carry out this miraculous process of photosynthesis, and that's the, we're capitalizing on all that with everything we do. We're growing healthy plants to do that. If we do that, and people will, you know, you hear a lot of folks in the general public today as they, as they turn their attentions to the, to the challenges that we have and say, well, why don't you all out there in agriculture just grow crops that use less water? Well, we could. We, like I say, we can grow anything we want, but you have to remember basic photosynthesis is going to dictate the parameters for every, every unit of carbohydrate, say basic glucose, is generated out of one round of the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis. It takes six units of water. We're not going to change that. You know, that's just fundamental fact. So if you're going to use less water, you're going to produce less plant. Those carbohydrates and like that glucose, those are the basic building blocks of life. They form together the larger starch molecules. They form cellulose. That's, we call that plant structure. That's how plants grow. They generate that from the photosynthetic operations in the plant. So you use less water, you produce less crop. You just better hope it's worth a lot when you produce it, but you're going to use less water to do so. So those are our basic parameters, and we can do that efficiently. And when I say efficiently, I mean agronomic, economic, as well as environmental. We can do all three simultaneously, and we know what that takes. That takes management, premeditated management on our part. We're going to the field to irrigate to try to accomplish those goals of adequate water supply. Really, we're dealing with a delicate balance here. We've got two forms of input. We have irrigation and rain. Rain's negligible for us, even when we had some rains last couple of weeks, but they're generally, neg generally negligible for us in these systems. And we have then loss and sources of loss that come out of this system, mainly from evaporation, which is off the soil, open soil surface, and transpiration right off the, crop, the top of the crop canopy. Collectively, we refer to that as evapotranspiration, and that's what we lose out of the system. We also have some losses associated with deep percolation, which we try to minimize at the bottom of the system, but yet we need some of that to, to accomplish leaching. So basically, what we're trying to do is balance what we put in versus what goes out. If we're 100% efficient, that would be the ideal balance is what you'd have. And also have to take into account every soil, every field is different with regard to soil water holding capacity. That's our, our reservoir that we're working from. So we're trying to operate that delicate balance of what the crop is using and what we replace with irrigation. And the question is how efficiently can we do that? So we have those two requirements, consumptive use of the crop and a leaching requirement. Essentially what we're having to do every time we go in the field to irrigate is we're, we're employing what we call the irrigator's equation. Now, you may not actually be sitting down calculating the irrigator's equation every time, but in essence, we are, because that's what we have to consider. We know that the area of the field we're trying to irrigate, the A, we know the volume of the flow in the irrigation system we're dealing with, right? That's the Q, the, Q, the flow volume. We should know the depth that we need to, reply, to apply to replenish that plant available water in the soil. And then our question oftentimes then comes down to what's the time that's all for T? What's the time do I need to make this irrigation set? Or if, same thing if you have a center pivot or, or irrigation through a drip. How much water do I apply over time? What are these parameters to accomplish my goal? And we're operating on, trying to delicate, operating on that delicate balance, recognizing, too, that our soils have limits with regard to soil water holding capacity from about, a, about an inch per inch of available water per foot of soil for a sand, loamy sand type soil, soil material, all the way up to about two inches at a max per foot of soil for a silt loam, silty clay loam type soil. So that's a reservoir that we have. And of course, our soils are stratified to some extent, but that's what we do in the field by making an evaluation of what's this field like versus this field next, right next door to it. And whenever we bring water out of a canal down a lateral and out into a field, particularly if you're dealing with it out here in this area, you're dealing with basins that are quite often dead level basins and flood irrigated. 
And we can be very efficient with these systems just deploying this outline. I just said, you know the area, you know the flow. We know how much we want to apply. It's the set times that are key for us to make sure we, we cut that water off at the right time. And of course, then there's going to be the efficiency that we have in that particular field. But a lot of these fields in this area have the benefit of being actually very efficient if, when they're managed appropriately. And because of the way they're structured with high flow turnouts and dead level basins and, and relatively reasonable amounts of, of area that we're irrigating at at a given time. So you hear a lot of criticisms around from, say, the non-agricultural community about flood irrigation. Why you guys flood irrigate? And there's, there's, there's this belief that it's automatically bad. And there are some irrigation systems that are automatically good. They aren't, in my view. It depends, we all can do that. With manage, we can manage efficiently if we, if we stop and think about what we're doing and how we, when the parameters we have and the limits we have with any of these systems to work with. But we can use these systems here pretty efficiently, actually. And we can do that, too, in several different kinds of configurations with row, row, row orientation or row configurations with the same principles, area, flow, the, time, the depth of water we need to apply, and the time that we need to make that irrigation set. So, t so that's essentially what we're doing. I, mean, I would just encourage us all to kind of rethink what we're doing in irrigation in, re in relation to that, to that kind of water management, and realize we're trying to address these two, these two objectives, keep up with the plant and that, that soil plant balance and leaching requirements, and remember this is our basic little model we're working from, just trying to balance out what we put in versus what we lose, and take, them, take into account the efficiency of the system we have. And basically, you look at it too, you say, well, there's a demand that comes out of the environment that's driving all of this. And there's a supply that comes out of our soil. We have some good, good tools at our disposal to, me to measure this evaporation off the straight evaporation and measure transpiration, collectively evapotranspiration. One of the best tools that we have to solve that, to, to put into this, this question, is really what, how much water is actually being lost, what's the reference evapotranspiration, the ETO. We have weather stations all over this state and several in this county that are providing outstanding weather information for you every day, right now as we speak, and that's the ASMET Meteorological Network. Well, we can get these kinds of values for reference ET, multiply that by a coefficient, crop coefficient, which is unique for the crop and stage of growth, and we can get a pretty good estimate on the, if, on the effective evapotranspiration out of that crop. So I would encourage you, to, if you haven't been doing that, just if you have a question about that, look at the ASMET website. Paul Brown's done an excellent job of putting that data together for all these sites where we can look in on any given day, and we can see, you know, literally you can see it by the hour, but you can see it by the day, what with the total evapotranspiration, reference evapotranspiration in that, for that site. And we can actually say for that crop then, pull out a KC value from that crop, and those are, those are accessible to us. Just multiply the KC value by this net, or this evapotranspiration, uh, reference evapotranspiration, it gives us an estimate then how much water this crop is actually using. Those are good estimates, and they're a, a good measure for us as a parameter, particularly if you sum them up over a week, or like re between an irrigation interval. How close am I coming to matching consumptive use in this crop? You want to think, too, if we have a crop that has 36 inches of water that's what we call consumptive use requirement, and I'm putting on 40 inches, that's about a 90% agronomic efficiency. If I'm putting on 45 inches to match to grow that crop, that's about 80%. Where does that other water go? A lot of it will go into leaching, and a lot of this is we're accomplishing a leaching fraction kind of inadvertently with our systems because they're not always 100% efficient, and that differential is helping us with that, which is important because as Wilfred Gardner used to say, our irrigation systems carry the seeds of their own demise through the salinity. If we don't manage it, it's catch up with us. For example, you take Colorado River water at 700 part per million, which would be a, on a good day, <laughs> and you multiply that out by 2.7, you can always calculate how, much, how many pounds of that solute or an acre foot of water, five acre feet and applied in a field in a given season, put up almost five tons of salt into that field in, a given, in, one, in just one season. So it has to be managed, but quite often we manage it through our extra irrigations that we have. And if there's a question about that, so you, have to, you can calculate what is, what is the leaching requirement for this particular crop by looking at the EC, the electrical conductivity, the salinity of the water, and the tolerance levels of the crop. And we can measure how much of a leaching fraction do I need and where am I with regard to efficiencies. And you're probably, a lot of times we're taking care of that with regard to our efficiencies or lack thereof in, the, in some of our systems of putting on a little extra water there. So the good thing to do too, if you have any concerns about salinity building up as we try to conserve our water, just watch. Watch the crop, watch the fields. 
That's the best thing you can do is get in the field and monitor. A field that looks like it still has good soil water, soil moisture, but it's showing a water stress early, that would be an indication of maybe a buildup of salinity. Take a sample and check and see. Same thing with sodicity. You see more crusting, difficulties in emergence. Uh, things, that's an indication to look at your, maybe your, your sodium levels in the soil. But most part, we, have, we, we can keep up a lot of this with regard to our, our, irrig our rotations and our irrigation efficiencies. Last few minutes here, I'd just like to re re review a few points with regard to nutrient management as we enter into this stage in the season. And remind us all, that fertilizer prices have been extremely high, as we all know. The prospects of them coming down anytime soon are not all that great. So fertilizer management efficiency is important for us. As we look at this, uh, what nutrients are required, we consider there are 13 mineral nutrients essential for plant growth. Some lists will say 17, some lists will say 20. A solid 13 for sure. Now the other thing about that though is that even though all these nutrients have been identified as being essential, it doesn't mean that all plants require all these mineral <laughs> nutrients at the same time. It also doesn't mean we need to have every one of them in a fertility program. And we have to remember too, fundamentally, the place where <coughs> the mechanism that plants take up nutrients and water all through the root system. We talk about foliar applications, but that's not how the plant really prefers to take up its nutrients and water is through the, through the leaves, very small amount. It's through the root system and it's through the, through the finely divided root hair. So it's important for us to evaluate the roots, not just in terms of health and disease, but also in terms of are they expanding and proliferating correctly. Look for compaction layers, things like that. We need a healthy root system for a healthy plant for both water and nutrient management. For nutrient management, I like to always come back and say, fundamentally, we're looking at the, like the 4R concept. The 4Rs meaning, number one, the right fertilizer, right fertilizer source at the right rate, at the right time, and the right place, those 4Rs. Really, we think about those four together, we kind of frame up with the application and management of a nutrient management program in concept. And we look at that, we think, that, well, this is a good time with fertilizer prices high to make a good assessment of what we have in the soil. And make a, that means we need a good soil test to come in there and evaluate what do we have at this time, really to make a good assessment coming into the beginning of a season. And look at good soil tests that have good methods as well as good indices that they can reply back to. So a good soil sample, usually we take about 10 to 12 inches in most of our soils and composite them together, get them into a lab that runs good procedures. And then hopefully then you get, you're always going to get back some recommendations, but you want to make sure those come in line with good indices that have been properly developed. And with that, we need what we call, particularly immobile nutrients, what we call correlation and calibration procedures. That is, we're looking for a soil test value, and how does that relate to actual a crop yield and response? And most of us in, in this business, we're always looking for this critical level. The critical level would say that's about where, above this point, you wouldn't expect an increase in yield from an application of this nutrient. That's important to have that in relation to a soil test result. So what does it mean? Where it's, are we high, or am I low, am I above or beyond this critical level? And that's particularly true for immobile nutrients. For example, you look at the California guidelines for lettuce, and they say, well, we all pretty much agree a sodium bicarbonate test for phosphorus is the best. Ammonium acetate for potassium extraction is probably the best. But the guidelines, the critical values change. California, what they call the, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, FREP, and you see Davis saying that a critical level is about 60 part per million for phosphorus as an example. Above 60, 60 part per million phosphorus from a soil test, you shouldn't have much of a response from extra, extra phosphorus fertilization. Below that, you've got a pretty good chance for, for a response, 60 part per million. 150 part per million is a critical level for potassium. We all pretty well agree on that one. Now actually, oh man, do this twice. And so they would actually say under that 60 part per million, for example, from a soil test would say, they would indicate maybe a, between 40 and 60, anything below that, at least start with like 20 pounds of, of starter P205 from California recommendations. And this industry, of course, moves back and forth from here to California, so you've probably seen some exposure to that. This isn't a very large figure, but I'll tell you, my colleague Charles Sanchez has done some work on this, quite a lot of work on this here in, in Arizona. And he's suggested, look at this critical level, it's above 30 part per million from the same kind of soil test, not seeing a response from phosphorus fertilization pretty consistently here. So that's a pretty bad, in soil science, that's a big, big swing from 30 to 60 part per million within the same industry in the same general part of the country. But it's something to take a look at. So if you look at Arizona standards that way, you say you have 30 part per million from a soil test, 
Probably not a high probability you're going to get a response on lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, these coal crops from additional pea fertilization. Don't know where you are with regard to the guidelines you're using, but I would suggest in there are times of tight fertility or fertilizer prices that might be some place to look. At least run some test strips in your field to kind of check that out if you're looking at soil tests and you think what are the critical levels I would work for from a, for a response. So that 30 part per million would be something to consider as opposed to the 60 from California. And of course, then we think about time and rate of application. The best way to apply any of these nutrients is in the soil. Soil applied met methods are always going to be the best. Broadcast applications are, are adequate, but less efficient. And of course, are least efficient, but probably water run applications, which pr primarily is associated with nitrogen. And with nitrogen, we're, no, we're, we're doing another chasing game. What we're trying to do in a, in a leaky system is encourage nitrogen fertilizer into a available form for the plant and try and encourage a maximum uptake into the plant, while at the same time we have some losses associated with leaching from volatilization or denitrification into these, in these systems as well. So it's, it's a leaky system at best, but what we're trying to do is try to facilitate as much transition in that fertilizer nitrogen into the plant as much as possible. That's where our 4R approach comes in and a good yield goal approach for, nat for, for nitrogen. We can measure the yield. We can make, make a yield goal approach, figure how much nitrogen does this crop totally need, subtract off residual from your soil and your water, and then make the, the difference is what we need to be looking at with, with regard to nitrogen, nitrogen application and nitrogen fertilization. So it sets a max for our, our nitrogen fertilization that way, and we can split the applications in season. For lettuce, the crop actually requires about 130, 50 pounds to grow a crop of lettuce. Might pay more we put on, but that's because of the efficiencies in that leaky system I've shown you with the nitrogen cycle. But that's what the plant actually requires. And the time of actual maximum uptake and utilization is from when it starts to pick up, the plant begins to pick up uh, its nitrogen, its uptake, its uptake and utilization, to when it actually reaches that maximum. That's the time for optimum application and efficiency. And with, with lettuce, you can see that's pretty dramatic. And what that translates to is that transition from the rosette stage is about when it really starts to pick up the, the nitrogen uptake. And that's true too when you have the coal crops sitting on true leaves as they're beginning to set out that nitrogen uptake begins to increase quite rapidly to the end of the season. So what we have with water and fertility are two, two strongest throttles. We have constraints on both with regard to availability with the water and pricing on the fertility. So it's a good time for us to reassess and come back to the fundamentals to keep a good healthy system and try to maintain sustainability. In the meantime, I am, I know all of you, we're all watching the river and we're hoping we can keep the river water coming down that river into our canals and into our fields and keep things productive here. I appreciate your time this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to participate. There's some time for questions. I'll be around here all day. So I look forward to visiting with you. And again, I uh, appreciate the chance to see you. Appreciate it. Good luck to you this season. Thank you. I'm going to start off by talking about Fusarium wilt of lettuce. This is caused by Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis lectuque. Um, some of the factors that affect disease are temperature. We know that in higher temperatures, the disease severity can be higher. Of course, that's also changing. Um, so, and that leads into inoculum levels in the soil. So there has to be a threshold level of inoculum in the soil to get disease. Well, at, we know that at lower temperatures, you don't see as much disease, but with higher levels of inoculum in the soil, we might see higher disease severity when we don't expect to see it, like in the cooler season, so uh, December, January. And also, uh, cultivar susceptibility is really important. Um, we need good uh, resistant varieties to help prevent disease. Um, there's some good tolerant ones out there. There's a lot of highly susceptible varieties. Okay, so the disease cycle of Fusarium oxysporum, or sorry, Fusarium wilt of lettuce, um, you can really start anywhere here, but we'll start, my pointer doesn't work, or maybe I don't know how to work it. Anyway, we start right over here with the chlamydospores. So, so chlamydospores are these uh, spores that can survive in these high temperature conditions with no water and no host. 
they can just sit in the soil for years and years. So there is a rapid decline over, um, over a year. So over like 12 months, if we might see a rapid decline of the amount of inoculum in the soil. But then you just see this plateau where you have a very low level of these in the soil for three, four years. So they can stick around for quite a long time. So what happens is when the, these spores come in contact with the roots, they sense those root exudates. And so they germinate and they grow into their roots. They can grow into those root tips. So as that root tip is pushing through the soil, there's some um, micro wounds that this, the germinating um, spore can get into. So the mycelium gets into. There's also wounds in the roots. So these, these uh, the, the pathogen can grow into all of those wounds pretty easily. So then the mycelium invades, uh, invades that root cortex. It grows through the cortex into the vascular system, into the xylem. Um, the mycelium grows into the xylem. There are spores that can travel with the water flow, and they clog up that xylem. There's also these plant responses that um, will clog up the xylem, so the plant can might cause the cells to collapse, or they can produce some chemicals that clog up those xylem. So the plant defense response also um, causes the, this kind of, these symptoms in the roots. And uh, the purpose is to wall off the cells, but because the pathogen can invade pretty efficiently, it, it ends up um, killing the plant. Um, and then you get this chlorosis and wilting, dieback, and in that, that tissue that's dying or dead, you get lots of mycelium and, and spore production. And so what that can do is that can immediately infect other lettuce plants. It can grow on organic material. It can grow on the cortex of roots. It, it, it can survive in that soil pretty well. Um, or it can form chlamydospores again and then over summer in the soil. OK, so some management for um, fusarium wilt. I know you know, a lot of you know this already. I'm just going to go over it again. Um, avoid spreading to, avoidance is the best way to control this disease. If you have a field that doesn't have fusarium, be very careful about bringing equipment into that field. Don't bring um, soil in on your boots if you just went into a field that has a lot of the, the pathogen. Crop rotation, I know, uh, you know growers want to grow lettuce. They don't want to grow broccoli, cauliflower. But rotating to uh, broccoli for a couple of years will actually um, reduce the amount of pathogen in the soil. We do know that there is some colonization in other plants. So um, cauliflower, so there's this, a study that looked at cauliflower, broccoli, and spinach and found that there's very little colonization of broccoli, but it will colonize the, the cortex of the roots a little bit. Um, there's about 7.4% colonization of the vascular system of cauliflower. So more, there'll be more colonization in the cortex, but um, uh, a little in the vascular system. Uh, spinach, you get about 50% colonization of that vascular system. Um, that being said, you get less of a buildup of the pathogen in the soil with these crops because you get far more colonization of that vascular system, which is producing all of that inoculum that's uh, increasing the disease pressure in the field. So rotating off is still, what you do is you get a steady decline of the pathogen, whereas with lettuce, you get a, a pretty steady increase of the pathogen in the soil. Um, tolerance. Of, uh, lettuce that is tolerant, it can be um, detrimental to how much inoculum is in that field because you, the tolerant varieties, they may be producing a marketable head, but they're also really increasing the amount of inoculum in the soil. So you really have to think about um, what you're, you're planting. OK, planting date, um, if you don't have a lot of the inoculum in the soil, you can avoid the disease by planting at a time when the disease is not as active. So the cooler season, that's not becoming a really great option. More recently, with the, the uh, amount of inoculum that's in the soil, um, 
I don't have any biological or chemical controls that I can recommend, but there may be a role for these uh, products in a field that has uh, a low level of inoculum. So if you don't have a lot of the pathogen in that field, you might be able to control the disease with some of these products when we have products that we can really recommend. Um, so it, this, this might be used in combination with soil health um, techniques. So, you know, building up soil organic matter, um, using, um, you know, cover crops, things like that. If we can improve soil health, we can suppress the, the pathogen in the soil. Um, there's also some cultural controls like biosolarization, solarization, flooding. Um, a lot of these are water intensive, which makes it not something that we can really use right now. I have a trial in the field right now looking at biosolarization, which is looking at, uh, so you add a carbon source and stimulate those microbes in the soil. And um, that's in combination with solarization. Seems to do really well, but you need to have water on the field for 21 days. And so when that becomes more of a viable method, then we'll try to integrate that into um, production. Um, resistant varieties are the best available tool. We all know that, um, and we, we just need more resistant varieties for fusarium wilt. Okay, I just want to briefly mention, and I, I try to mention this in all my talks because I, I know people get confused by this concept. Um, Forma specialis, that's, so we have genus, species, and then with Fusarium oxycerum, we have these Forma specialis. Those are crop specific. So the Fusarium oxysperum that causes um, the, the wilt on melon or cotton, it's a different form of specialis. They do not infect. So the one on cotton will not cause fusarium wilt on lettuce. It's specific to the crop. Um, <clears throat> there's four described races in um, the US or in the world. And um, only one has been found in the US at this time. And I just want to just show you this map so you can see race one is the most common and there's a few more that are found in other countries at this point. We identify races by a set of differential hosts and um, this is set up by the International Seed Federation. Um, I've planted these out in the field. I did not have Romabella last year. I'll have Romabella this year. And this, the, the nice picture I had was a little early so you can't see the disease very well. But um, this is Patriot right here. It pretty much, uh, a week later, it was all dead. This is Bantu Red Fire. If you pulled, there's some stunting here. If you pulled up every one of these plants, they would have discoloration in the roots. And this is Costa Rica number four. If you have, so these are usually done in the greenhouse. So in the field, it's, it's a little harder to tell. Um, it, it's really, it's harder to work this out because highly resistant in the field is, not the same as highly resistant in the greenhouse. I've found root discoloration in uh, Costa Rica number four. So um, it, it's not a perfect system, but it, it really tells us a lot about um, resistance genes and it really helps the breeders develop new varieties for specific areas with the, with the races, with known races. Okay, so one of the studies that um, is in progress right now is this population study. So there's been a lot of questions about um, if the population in Arizona and California are changing. There's two, um, there's two projects in process right now looking at this, and there's two options for what might be happening. One is there is a change in the population, so we're seeing uh, either a more aggressive pathogen or we're seeing one that is changed where uh, it can overcome resistant, different resistance genes in the, the lettuce. Um, these are two projects. One of them I'm managing and the other is managed by Alex Putman in um, California and I'm, I'm cooperating on that project. Um, and we're, we're trying to look at what's the, like I said, the source of variation in the field. Um, and 
nobody's really going to understand this other than maybe Jeanette, but <laughs> there's a, we looked at VCDs, and this is like a real old school method of looking at how similar things are. And what it means is if, some, if something's a similar VCG, they're, they're nearly clonal. So they're very, very similar. And the, all the Arizona isolates so far are the same VCG. So that tells us that the population is very genetically similar. And there's also been a molecular assay done that um, looked at a subset of these isolates, and they were all very molecularly similar. Um, this is not the end of the story. We don't need know if we looked at the right uh, markers. Uh, we're doing more work to better, we're doing some pathogenicity studies. We're doing more work to see if the population is uh, as similar as it seems. Um, but this, this, so this information reinforces the idea that it's actually the amount of inoculum in the soil that is causing the, uh, the changes that people are seeing. Um, there, is an ice, there are some isolates in Salinas that um, the USDA is working on that do seem to be different. They are looking different on the, um, in this assay, in the, on the differentials. So that is being worked on right now. Uh, I work with this group pretty closely. We have monthly meetings. As soon as we have an answer, you will have the answer. OK. Um, another project that I've been working on for a few years, I've been doing these since 2019, we have fusarium with of lettuce trials. I look at um, varieties, breeding lines. So I work with a lot of the public programs to test their breeding lines. Um, new releases, so these are um, releases to breeders to help uh, develop new varieties. Um, we're looking at wild types for new sources of resistance chemical controls, cultural controls like biosolarization. And I just wanted to mention that we're going to have a field day on November 30th of this year. This is out in the JV field in the South Gila Valley, same place we've had it. We send out emails. You'll be informed. Uh, 2019 or 2020, it poured. No, maybe it was 2019. It poured a couple days beforehand. So you know, if we have to change it, you'll know. But so uh, at this point, it's on November 30th. Uh, here's some results. Of course, the top part is cut off. This is marketable heads for some um, iceberg varieties from last year. Um, this, the field just had very severe disease last year, so it really, um, the, the top performers really are highlighted here. So Fredonia from Three Star and Powerball from Seminus, those were the ones that really performed well. But you know, it's 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 surprising that that these varieties didn't perform better because they they generally perform a lot better in the field. But it was very high disease pressure this past year, and these are not resistant. So, um, if the year before we had less disease pressure, and if you look at the data from last year, it looks uh, those those um, came out a lot better. Um, this is disease incidence for the romaine. We had, except for um, um, Bondi, we had 100% uh, marketable heads. Some of these are out of slot, so we didn't get um, um, uniform stands. But we, knowing that, we evaluated these just from uh, symptoms of disease. So it could be yellowing. It could be stunting for in-slot varieties. But generally, everything performed really well, as we would expect. Um, you can see all of these trial results if you go to deserteggsolutions.org. So we have all the results from our past trials. We'll have information from the trials this year. Um, we also have information on other projects. I need to. We need to add a. Uh, a page for the INSV projects and for downy mildew projects, but you can find all this information uh, on deserteggsolutions.org. Okay, so I just started working on a project on downy mildew, and that's um, caused by Bremia lactuque. Um, symptoms of this disease, you see these angular lesions that are light green to yellow. They'll turn brown and crispy as they age, and they're angular because they're, they're in between veins. 
Um, and on the lower leaf surface, you'll see signs of the disease, which are that fluffy white growth. And that's the, that's the actual pathogen that you're looking at. Um, they require, it, it requires relatively damp, cool conditions, um, moisture on the leaves. You, get wind, you have dispersal from the wind. It doesn't seem to overwinter in the soil uh, or over summer in the soil. I forget where I am sometimes. Um, fungicides are a good way to uh, prevent the disease, but once you have the disease, it's hard to, uh, it's, not, it's not a curative. Um, uh, reducing leaf wetness using, so using uh, furrow or drip instead of uh, sprinkler irrigation will help prevent the spread of the disease and reduce severity. But again, resistant varieties are the best available tool for control of this disease. Uh, this is uh, sporangia. So when you're looking at the underside of the leaves, you're look, seeing those, the sporangia that come through the stomata. And uh, you can tell by this picture that those, those uh, sporangia fours release really easily because if you look, they're all detached. So with the wind, they just easily disperse uh, between, in, in the field and between fields. Uh, they, can, they can spread really easily. <clears throat> Right now, there's nine U.S. races, and, but one through four are no longer detected in the Western U U.S. So there's five races that are important uh, that have been um, identified. And just like the Fusari Moxisperm lactuque, there's a set of differentials that tell you what the race, that can help determine what the race is. Um, it's a much larger set. It's about 30 varieties but there's also a lot of races out there. And these, these differential sets are from the, the IBEB board in the US. Okay, so this is showing you, so these are the races that have been uh, characterized. And this is an example of some of the differentials. And what they do is it, it's, it's, the, it's a combination of a plant gene the, the resistance gene in the plant and the virulence gene in the pathogen that is what's making up, uh, that, that's the reaction. So this is basically saying that um, th this is a set of resistance genes in the plants. I don't want to get too deep into that, but um, that tells breeders what resistance genes will hold up. So if you, um, if we know that, uh, Race seven is around. Uh, we know that the plant has to have uh, some specific resistance genes to hold up against that race. So um, there's a number of isolates or from Yuma that um, are that are of these races, but unfortunately, most of the races are novel and not one of these. Um, these races that have been characterized. Um, and probably the more we sample, the higher number we'll get. Um, one of the problems is there's not a lot of isolates that have been collected. So you see, um, well, the pandemic really made it difficult for the, this is, these are all to, um, these have all been to, sent to Richard Mitchell Moore at UC Davis. Um, there was a lower number in the past few years. There's not many isolates from Arizona. So, so there's not a lot that we know about the Arizona population. And what I'm trying to do is uh, overcome that. So how can we get more isolates to Richard Mitchell Moore's lab to be characterized so we know more about the population, so we know what, um, uh, what varieties will hold up, we'll know what DMR actually means. Um, so, that um, and also get that number up, so we know, you know, what race. Um, so we just have a better idea of what's going on in the Western U.S. Okay, so what I'm doing is, um, I am. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking ahead to my next slide. Okay, so we want to know what the structure of the population is in Arizona. Is do are DMR varieties truly DMR? Um, 
I want to get some breeding material. I want to be able to screen some breeding material for people so they can see if they're if if they're what they're breeding for the desert actually will hold up in the desert. Um, and we also want to know if there's fungicide resistance in the population. Okay, so just want to mention that in these are California isolates. There were a few isolates that were um, phenotype for sensitivity to three chemicals. And to, there was a few isolates that were found to have some insensitivity. So it's important to really understand what's going on uh, generally in the population so we don't lose uh, chemicals. I want to mention that um, Arondis is for Phytophthora, not for downy mildew. It's a single chemical product, and that's why they're using it to test. But since that's a combination product, um, if you saw insensitivity, in this assay, it does not mean it's insensitive to the product you will use for downy mildew. Um, was that good, Jeanette? <laughs> Okay, yeah. So I, I, I've talked to Richard about using this product in this test and just to say that it does not mean that you're going to lose Arondis Ultra. It just means, it, it's just because you want to do a single chemical in these kind of tests. Okay, so, but this, by sending more isolates to UC Davis, we will have this information. Okay, so here's, what the plan is for this year, we are going to have two drop-off sites for samples. So uh, here at Yak, we're going to have a field trial where we are going to plant the differentials. We're going to plant some breeding lines. We're going to um, look at a series of uh, varieties that are um, that have uh, that are claimed to be DMR, uh, downy mildew resistant. And uh, we will be planting those out in the field. We will be evaluating them so we know what virulence genes are out there. Um, and we will be sending samples to Richard Mitchell Moore. So we can't tell individual, we won't be able to tell individual races, but we will know what genes hold up against the population by having this field trial. But we are gonna send samples to UC Davis so they can tell us exactly what the races are and how many novel ones and maybe get some more race, uh, races identified and characterized. Um, we also are gonna make it easier for you to give us isolates or to give us samples. So if you have downy mildew in a field that you're working in, you can bring it, there's gonna be two sites, you can bring it here. There's also a downtown site that's right near Home Depot. You just bring your sample in, plastic bag, uh, drop it in the refrigerator, fill out some paperwork, and uh, we will send it to Richard Mitchell. Or you can send it yourself, but we wanna make it really easy where you just swing by, drop the sample with the paperwork, and we will ship it. Um, there, this, is a, this is the paperwork right here. I just want to point out this is where the, the Wysita office, downtown office is. It's right near um, Home Depot. Uh, on, you go to, on the back on the highway side. Um, the address is on the, the form though. And I'm going to, once we have a downy mildew page on our website, all this information will be on um, the website. So go to deserteggsolutions.org. Okay, quickly, I just want to bring up Pythium Will. I talked about this a little bit at uh, uh, the workshop uh, on INSV. Uh, Pythium has been popping up in combination with INSV. It always seems to be in combination with INSV. It's, uh, it's, it's an OMIC. You have the oospores for long-term survival. You have these uh, the zoospores that can spread the disease in or the pathogen in water, so it can basically swim down the furrow. Um, above ground symptoms is the wilting of the outer leaves. You get collapse. It looks a lot like sclerotinia or downy mildew. You, we've been seeing it in the spring. Uh, we see it when it's warm, it's wet. Um, you can tell it's not sclerotinia because unless it's just 
brown and completely collapsed, uh, that crown will be still intact and you won't see any mycelial growth. Um, sometimes you'll see a little tuft of green right in the middle. Um, that's a really good um, indication that it's pythium. Uh, I've only found this with an infected plant, an INSV infected plant, but I just want you to know when you see it in the field, what it looks like. And if you see an increase of this, just let us know, just keep an eye on it in case we need to address it in the future. Uh, below ground symptoms, you, it, it's, uh, you see the, the, the outside of the fine roots getting degraded. So you basically just see the, the string of the vascular system. Um, it's, sometimes it's uh, blackish. You get this root, this root discoloration. You don't get the, just the vascular symptoms. So you see the cortex and the vascular system rotted. Um, if you have it in combination with another pathogen like fusarium, you will see vascular um, symptoms, but it, it does look a little different than um, fusarium. Well, it looks a lot different than fusarium. Okay. Um, I don't know a lot about why we're seeing this in um, Arizona other than it's in combination with INSV. It seems to be in the soil here. Um, it is not causing a problem at this point. Basically, we're seeing about 1% INSV in some of these fields, and about you know one percent of that has pythium. But I just want you to be aware of this and just keeping an eye on it. If we get more INSV, we might be seeing more pythium. Of course, your the INSV, the plant with INSV is already not a marketable head, so maybe it will never matter. I hope it never matters. Okay, I want to mention that we had an INSV workshop a couple weeks ago. We made these immunostrip kits for testing INSV out in the field. We have some kits left over. We'll have them at the end of the workshop. If, so if you want one, um, uh, they'll, they'll be in the outside somewhere. <laughs> Look for the cooler. Um, and we, these kits were, were sponsored by uh, these companies, and we really appreciate their sponsorship of that. And all we ask is if you get a positive out in the field, if you can just report it, there's a little reporting system that's in the kits and we, we just wanna be able to track the disease over the next year. It will really help us understand what's going on and make predictions for future years. Okay, 